that there's a lot packed into this uh, presentation, but I have some big links in there that you can go to free resources related to it. Um, so we'll get started. Um, she's already gone through my bio stuff. Um, this is my work family. Just wanted to give it a shout out. My brother is actually one of my business partners, so I'm kind of a quasi family We've grown from three in 2009, founded in 2008 to 15 to 14 today. We've been with Rob. My name is Rob. Um, so, what we'll cover today is uh, the definition of inbound marketing. Uh, a lot of people will confuse it with internet marketing. They are very similar, uh, but not exactly the same. And go through all the steps of how to create an effective inbound marketing campaign. And then I've got a lot of more in the end for Q&A. I might have to walk through there once in a while to make sure my time is correct and just push this piece of So what is inbound marketing? It is a new methodology that the phrase was coined in uh, 2006 actually by HubSpot, a, a software, a marketing software provider. But it's really a lot of the things that we've already employed and are happening in the, the marketing culture. Focusing on creating quality content because our consumer today is going out researching and making their decisions instead of being advertised to and just reacting to those advertisements as much. Um, so with social media and the internet, people are can be pulled toward your product and your service through what they Google or through what they see on social. So I'm not really takes the takes us through that process and make sure we're touching them at all those stages. So if you align your content with your ideal customer's interests and points and challenges, then that's going to organically pull them towards your website. Um, so an inbound, you can be inbounding with other types of, of marketing, but inbound specifically uses your website as your hub, um, because so many people are searching and finding content on the web today. So we want to talk about inbound versus outbound, inbound marketing engages instead of interrupts. Um, your leads and prospects, while outbound, like cold calling and purchasing of email lists, those are interruptive methods of marketing that used to work just fine but are, have declined in performance um, because people are more searching for their own answers. Um, and it's just a little bit more loosely, loosely targeted, whereas inbound marketing is much more specific. Um, the return on investment with inbound marketing it is, it has become sort of a way for smaller uh, and medium-sized businesses. Still works great for large businesses as well, but it leads to the cost less on, on average. So um, about a 61% average uh, less than leads from outbound techniques. And inbound techniques would be things like social media, SEO, blogging, um, versus outbound techniques would be some of those others that, that I mentioned, or even, you know, sort of blanket advertisement for a large area. So the inbound marketing methodology has a couple of stages. We're just going to quickly run through those. The attract stage, that's the stage where you're trying to attract people to your website. Um, but it's not just any traffic, it's the right traffic. Because if you pull the wrong traffic to your website, you lose to high bounce rates and other things that will hurt your search engine optimization. Um, so we want the right traffic because we also don't want to Waste the time of their salespeople having leads and they're not appropriate for them. Um, blog posts, your website, your search engine optimization of your website, social media, and some uh, pay per click and SEM type marketing can be done in a kind of what we call inbound. That can be very effective. So the convert stage is when you are taking that traffic to the website and converting them to leads. And that's done through calls to action on your website, landing pages and forms, because the landing page, where they fill out a form, is how you convert them into someone you actually met. And the close stage is where you're taking those leads and you're closing them through marketing automation, personal reach out of the sales team, um, your, your CRM, CRM integrations, um, and workflows or automations. And so that's transforming that lead into a customer um, with those personal connections and automation. The delight stage is hopefully we'll get a lot of our customers too because that's when they become your brand ambassadors. 
And that's where we're not forgetting about them after they become customers. We keep an opportunity to keep engagement and connection with them, personal connection, um, or what feels like personal connection or strategic email automation to make sure that they don't feel like they were just a number. Um, that's going to give you those opportunities for upselling to them um, and just delighting them in a reaching out to them on social media, some unexpected gifts, so to speak. So that's when you create that happy promoter of the brands that they love. So now we're going to go into the meat of the presentation, which is how to create an effective email marketing campaign. Um, some of the stuff in here is helped quite a bit through some type of marketing software, but there's certainly anything that's in here could be, um, most things that are in here could be done with Google Analytics and other, um, you know, personal touch manually until you were to that point where you had so many needs you just couldn't deal with it <laughs> manually. Uh, and step one is to develop an offer. So, um, offers come in many forms, books, white papers, podcasts, uh, infographics, um, product demos. So the offers have multiple types of offers. And the first thing you start thinking about is what type of offer do I create would be what type of, where are you trying to get that person uh, in their uh, buyer's journey. So if you're trying to capture more people just as before they've even gone to compare you against your competitor, then you're probably going to want to start with the awareness stage. That's sort of the first part of the buyer's journey. So there's an awareness stage, consideration stage, and a decision stage. Now if you already have content in some of these other stages, you might you might be starting at a different stage. I, I think if you're starting 101, start with the awareness stage because that's where you're going to start forming a relationship with that prospect prior to when they've already decided what the solution is and are comparing you against others who haven't formed trust with them. So the awareness stage is a, a stage of, right after I go through these stages, I'm going to give you a way to download some information about this. So if you on the screen, it's kind of small, but the awareness stage is when someone has a problem that starting with Google pain points and challenges, they might not even realize that what you sell is the solution or one of many solutions. Um, for example, someone wanting more leads may have no idea that a website redesign or uh, inbound marketing might help them get that. They're just Googling what that pain point is. So the consideration stage is when they're, they've now clearly defined what the problem is. They, they figured out of the many options for solving the problem, they pretty much narrowed it down to what that option is. Um, that's when you're going to offer them more case studies, product comparisons. But lots of people have this type of information on their website. What they're missing typically is this type of information on their website, like ebooks about just a pain point and challenges. It's not specific to selling, selling, selling your company. Because this is where you start to capture their interest and they feel like they picked you instead of feel like they were marketing to So in the consideration stage, you're going more towards things that actually mention your product or service or your company. And then in the decision stage, that's when if they know what the problem is, they've decided your solution will fix it, they're comparing you to other vendors. So that's when you're offering product demos or trials, uh, free consultation, those types of things would be offered for that stage. Here's that promised resource for later. I'm going to take a sip of water and you write that down. It's just a downloadable free guide from our website. Um, and it's buyer's journey content mapping worksheet. So you can plug in which stage you're trying to go for. And it offers you places to write in um, or type in the, the different options that is you're planning out that mapping content for buyer's journey. Because ideally, you want something at every stage. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Can we go on to the next? Okay. So all of this also ties back to we know what stage we're trying to go with our buyer in their journey, but the biggest thing related to all this, the key pivotal point is understanding 
your buyer persona, because that's going to guide your choices. Um, the buyer persona is not quite like a target market. It's, it's more specific. It's, it's a fictional but data-driven picture um, or a profile of your ideal customer or prospect. Um, you know, who's going to you know, bring the most ROI, who's easiest to deal with, not necessarily who you're working with today if, if you're wanting to migrate from that uh, person, but who the ideal would be. Um, and, and creating your buyer persona is a whole other thing. I've got a downloadable for you for that. Um, but that person guides the kind of content you, you're going to create. Uh, not everybody wants a white paper. White papers work for specific industries, but not uh, for everybody. So the, your buyer persona might prefer an ebook or a checklist or something of that nature. And sometimes it's trial and error, but you can kind of take an intuitive guess and then, um, you know, based on your previous experience or how people have really reacted to things. But just remember, you don't you don't have to have all of those different types of, of offers. Pick, pick what works for your buyer persona. It's also going to guide how you deliver it, the way that your buyer persona um, wants that piece of content delivered. So here's the resource for that, actually developing a really um, comprehensive buyer persona. And there's the bit link for that. Sorry. Okay. So, step one was developing our offer, and step two is creating a killer landing page, because that's how we're going to deliver the offer. Again, this is all on our website. Um, so, landing page has several different components, and I'm going to go through each of these in more detail, but it's the headline, the body, the image, the form, and the call to action. Now the call to action, there is a call to action, so to speak, on the landing page, but when, in relation to the about the call to action, brings them to the landing page. The call to action is somewhere else on our website. So just to be able to have a picture in mind of what a landing page is, because Lots of different people call it, they do different things, but what we refer to it as is the, the place where someone gets your offers. This is an example of one of our top performing landing pages, happens to be about the buyer persona, the buyer persona uh, ebook, and it has a 60.71% submission rate, which is which is pretty good with your target is around 20. Um, so we're, we're really happy with the way this performed, but you're kind of always tweaking. Uh, to see what what changing what components will make that submission rate better. Because with submission comes that, that lead capture. So now we're going to go into a little bit more detail uh, in our step two of, of our uh, end off campaign, talking about the headline and the body. So you're going to want to use a very clear um, action oriented headline, uh, and it needs to match the CTA or call to action which is somewhere else on your website. So basically, if the two don't match, then someone comes there and they're like, this wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And they're going to leave. <laughs> You're not going to get your submission. So that's why uh, th those two need to be as close as, po as possible in the title. Um, and just make it really clear what they're getting so that in a blink, they can tell. You're going to also want to remove any distractions. Um, depending on the content management system that you use, there might be templates that you don't even know about that don't have a header. Um, but th this is basically, <coughs> you're not trying to track them because they can still click home, <laughs> you can click on your, on your uh, logo to get home. But you're trying to avoid any diversion, especially for people with ADD, of which I'm one, so I'm not complaining about that. But you don't want to keep, you don't want to get them off of your website with social sharing or other things on this part of the landing page. You also want to keep that keep your body text brief. Um, use bold and numbers and bullets to emphasize the value. What's in it for them? Why am I going to give you, as a visitor to your website, all that information? Um, and we're going to talk about how you don't want to ask them for all that information yet. If this is a very early stage offer, you just want to ask them the bare minimum on that form enough to get the lead. Um, 
but you just want to keep it keep it brief on the body. And next, we're going to talk about the image. So I have found in, in uh, my experience that an image actually represents the thing, a physical, tangible object uh, works best uh, as far as is this component of the landing page. But there will be some things like consultations or free assessment. It's harder to find that image. Um, if you have one person that would be doing that, show their face. They know exactly who they're going to be talking to. Or a team of people. Um, but having that tangible object or, or uh, component right there for your image does impact the submission rate for landing pages. On the floor, you just want to be sure that you don't want to bury it, like have this big text and then the form is way down here because if they weren't convinced, they are going to just leave before actually filling out the form. Sometimes people are, they are not going to even read any of this because they already know they want it and they just want to get to the form and get it down really quickly. Um, so just make sure when it, when it reorients for mobile that that form, that form is set up down to the bottom. Um, there also, you might, if, it, if, if you get a heavy amount of mobile traffic, if you're looking at Google Analytics or, or your techie is looking at Google Analytics, you know that heavy mobile, consider offering it a couple of places. You can do it up here and then include information in between and then include it again. Um, just to make sure that however that person is searching or using, you know, it will be there for them. Um, and the form's length impacts conversion. So the more fields there are, the less we you will get. Um, so if you're starting out, just get the most critical essential piece of information that you might need for your, uh, your marketing automation software, your email system. I like to always get first name. If you just want subscribers and don't want to ask them for their first name, you just want to ask them for their email, that's perfectly fine. But then if you have a personalization token, that might end up in someone getting an email that says, hey, first name. Or um, how your, your marketing system is set up. Um, some of them do have default tokens. You can say, hey there. Uh, it doesn't have a file um, so, we, so we talked about, hmm, there's a little odd thing going on. That's OK. Um, but basically, what is it? The, the shorter it is, the more likely we are to convert. Um, and in fact, if you have three fields, it's about an average 25% conversion rate. Um, three to five fields, you're going down to 20%. If you have six plus fields, it's a 15% average. So just remember, you're going to have more opportunities to get captured more information as you get, because you get to know that lead. Uh, drop downs sometimes are necessary, but they will also um, <coughs> cut down on the conversion rate. So all, the other thing that impacts your form, again, this is just trying to get as many submissions as possible, um, would be the field choices. The big one that will reduce your submission is asking for a phone number. So a few of us really want to get phone calls today, it seems so. Asking for a phone number is going to reduce that. They don't want to be They've had those telemarketers calling them. Um, asking for address, 4% reduction, asking for age. This one surprised me. I don't think if you ask me my age, that would be like 8% reduction. But maybe that's true. <laughs> I'm going to lie. Um, but asking for city and state, not as big of a deal. But, you know, unless you need the ad, you have it in there, I would just ask for the minimum. So the other component of the landing page that impacts conversions is the button that they use to actually submit the form. Strangely, or not so strangely, uh, the word choice on that button matters. And this is a, just a little a study that was done by HubSpot a couple years back uh, in their marketing software platform that measures all this stuff. But click here and <coughs> perform better on, on forms by 30% and 25% respectively. And then I know sometimes you have to say register, but you might be able to say click to <coughs> you know, to join us or join us instead of register, um, the register performs worst of all. And I think, I was thinking about this, I, there, the data was not in the study, but I personally think it's because register sounds like a process. And people just don't really want to have to go through a process and want to get done. What are the other two words up there? Uh, yeah, the other two words, click here, go, submit, download, register. Submit. Yeah. Now, 
we don't necessarily, you know, we play around with all the different types of wording on our, on our form buttons. Um, it really does also depend on the industry and the type of persona. So. <laughs> So the last thing that, uh, related to the landing page we're going to talk about is the call to action. And that's again the thing that gets your attention to you come to the landing page. So there's a couple of best practices related to that. Um, this is an example. This is really the call to action, but we like to, in some, in some cases, surround it with the visual cue that you're going to get in the people, because a lot of people are more familiar with that today. Um, but it needs to be visually striking. Uh, with copy that compels the visitor to click. Uh, just a couple of words works best, and that's where they're talking about this. But I still like to keep the other stuff <coughs> as well, just, just enough, because they're going to scan it. Um, Action-oriented, things like get, download, and claim. Just put that action in the person's mind, and it will like to get clicks. Uh, size is also important. You don't want it, you want it to be large enough that you can see from distance, but not so large it just takes over the page and drowns out the content. Because then it might start looking like an ad or um, a piece of the content on the page versus actually being a call to action. Uh, you also want to make sure that they are very clear what they get when they click on the CTA or uh, the call to action. We like to get fancy and creative, but sometimes that sends the prospect down the wrong road and they feel that they've been duped. Uh, location, this is the location on your website. So depending on what that piece of content is, if it is the awareness stage, it might be on a blog post that you have a CTA. If it is a consultation or a demo, that's probably going to be on an interior page of your website, not the blog part of your website. So you want to put where it is, you want to make sure it's easy to find. And it doesn't hurt to put it in multiple formats, like a, like a text click through a link somewhere up at the top of the blog post, but in more of an image type the CTA at the top. I would have it be the same, but depending on how, where that person is scanning through, they might be ready to go ahead and download the offer or not even finish the blog post. Uh, you want to make sure it stands out from the rest of your website. Um, usually, it makes the designer cringe a little bit. They want everything to be harmonious. Um, you can use white space. It can match your website, but that white space brings your attention to it. But in general, contrasting color will help make that very visible to your, to your visitor. So now, we created our offer, we put it on a killer landing page, and we're getting leads. So, or that's the plan. We want to do this before we hit the leads. This is, but this is part of our, our campaign process. So step three is planning out how you're going to nurture those leads. This particular um, description is going to be about marketing automation, but you certainly can nurture leads manually if you don't have marketing automation software in place. <coughs> So, marketing automation, basically a fancy name for emails that are triggered by <coughs> visitor behavior. Um, and it's going to be based on certain visitor behavior. You can craft a, a series of strategic emails, and what that does is, it's not, hey, thanks for downloading this, will you buy from me? Because that's not going to work um, to build trust. It's more of like, you know, thanks for your download, you might also find this useful. So that is a help instead of I'm trying to sell it to you. And that's the inbound lead. Methodology is trying to be not so salesy and more helpful. We're trying to help you, We're trying to provide value to you. And now you'll be seen as the authority in your industry. And they think of that, that need, they're going to come to your company versus someone else's. Because that they have all your ebooks and they have all your other information that they've been perusing through it as they were looking for a solution. So you're nurturing the prospect down the sales funnel. Trust, 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 buy. Um, but you're also pre-qualifying those leads because they may not be a right fit. So then when they come back again, you might be asking them more questions on that form 
for a different type of offer. You're getting a little bit more picky now. And now when you're trying to, those, those other people that didn't buy from you could still be your brand ambassador. They may not ever be a fit. But they can still talk right about, talk to everyone about your company on social and other places, and that's a good thing. But they may not be worthy in, in some respects of your sales people's time, and then they're going to complain about how the marketing team didn't do what they're supposed to do. You know, we, don't, we don't want that. We want to be a help to our sales team and sort of work together. Um, so we're going to pre-qualify those leads with certain types of automation before they are handed off to sales. Is this all making sense? Okay, so when we send those emails, again, building trust, um, and they're just going to become more sales ready. They're going to have those barriers coming down, again, feeling like they picked you instead of being sold to. So on your marketing automation, there's a couple of tips related to this, and the first is timing. You want to time that automation to happen very, very quickly after you capture the loop. If you look at your browser, you can see how many websites you visit in a day. And depending on your job function and how you're using the web, it probably is quite a few. And you might not remember um, that you were at, on someone's website uh, yesterday. So you want to time that marketing automation to happen pretty quickly. And that's because response rates decline as the lead gets older. So if I read a whole month, to ever reach out to them, whether it's manually or through automation, there's much less likely chance of them remembering me, and then you're going to get unsubscribes and spams. So the tip number two is targeting. Tip number one, timing. Tip number two is targeting. Targeting is going to improve your email performance. I don't know if you guys knew this, but there's newfangled ways that, that um, that you're being measured when you send your emails. So it impacts your email deliverability if people don't open your email. That's why purchasing lead lists, while it has worked, I'm sure, if you buy enough of them, you'll get down to the to those final ones. And if you have a really quality list, it could be different. But if you're not sure about the quality of the list, <coughs> just have a big database of people, you may by sheer numbers get to the number of sales that you need, but you're also hurting your, your email deliverability if it's sending from your domain. Um, so it means the next time you get a send, you could be filtered out before the person even gets it. So that's why the segmentation piece of it is so key. Don't send your message to everybody on your list or send the same message different ways to the different types of people on your list. And a lot of uh, email tools have this segmenta segmentation capability. You're going to target groups. There are certain ways that you might dice them up. Uh, some ways that we've found most beneficial things like geography. If you only serve certain areas or you have different services in different areas, geography is going to be important. And also, you don't want to send a local event to someone who's not local. Unless you have some other reason behind that, like to let them know that your um, company is, is you know, helping, you know, sharing the way and they might be other reasons to tell them. But uh, industry would be important if you service different industries, different ways, company size is going to impact uh, if your product only serves a certain company size or shifts in nature depending on the company size, the person's job role. That one's a big one because if I, I might have a product that works really well for the whole company, but the CEO has different reasons for wanting that product than the CFO. CFO might talk more in financials. The CEO might talk more about you know, the vision and, and the performance of the company. Um, COO is a different CMO, needs it to be created. Um, so that job role is a really good way to think about your segmentation. Also, depending on the, the marketing software that you might have in place, you might be able to see what offers they downloaded. You can even do that manually. If you if you don't have that those tools, you can tag them. You know, certain people who download certain offers uh, into those lists because then you know where their interests lie, especially if they come back again. If they come back to get the same type of offer related 
um, you know that that's that's the way you need to talk to them. That's where you need to sell them, but yet not look like you're selling. Um, also, the website pages that they visited can tell uh, important, an important story as well. So, uh, some marketing software has the ability to see that, um, but you can also, if you need to do it manually, ask people. You know, what the salesperson can ask, depending on how your company's set up. You know, can you tell us, do you mind telling me how you found it? And if you really talk to people about that process, it adds a lot of insight into what pieces of marketing is that you step. Step four is tell your tribe. So we've created the offer, put it on the landing page, figured out how we're going to do the nurturing of our new leads, but we can't forget about our tribe, which I think is a term coined by Seth Godin, but it's a group of people who care about you and what you do. So that might be your customers, your happy customers, your colleagues, your industry peers, um, or people who are on your subscriber list that just stay interested. They like the personality of your company. They like the culture. Um, those are the people that are already in your database, and you don't want to forget to tell them about the offer um, that you just put together. The most direct way to get to them would be emailing. So then we're going to give you six quick tips about emailing your tribe. Um, the, the first thing is don't tell them a whole lot of stuff about email. <laughs> get a one focused. Uh, purpose of that email being the call to action for that offer. So don't, the newsletter format, while it works in some cases, if that's not where you want to put the offer for this, if you want to have a good uh, click through rate. Um, personalization, plenty of the email systems that we use or can be done manually. Um, personalizing that email increases the the open and click rates. If the personalization isn't, I mean, a lot of people have gotten sort of savvy to that, hi, Holly, da, 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 you know, they, they're kind of um, familiar with that. But there are other types of personalization you can do. Uh, we have one client that works very well to have the city name in there, but to be able to say in your city. Um, so that will increase your open rate, but also personalization inside the email is what I'm talking about, is clicking click rate increases. You also don't want to forget about the mobile experience because the mobile layout, um, or making sure you have a mobile friendly layout, a lot of people read email on their phones these days, so um, you want to make sure you're ready for those other devices. Uh, tip number four for emailing your tribe will be making it shareable on social media and putting the email platforms out that. Buttons, the buttons where you share this with your friends. And you're also going to want to have an HTML version or a web based version of the email. And I'm sure you've seen that when you're on your phone and it says, you know, if you can't see this, open it up uh, in a web browser. But that, all, that just allows people to share it as well. Once you really nail down the format that you really that you like, you can clone it and reuse it. So you went to all that work, but that's just going to set the stage for further uh, email marketing that you do. And then the rest of your email marketing, you really should focus on the compelling subject line. Because if they never open it, they never know what you're going to tell them. Um, also, we are, in addition to the compelling subject line, it's not on the slide, but timing is good to measure too. People. <coughs> Uh, some people are going to more likely be thinking about your product or, or service during the work week and on the weekends they're really only caring about personal stuff. Other people are there at work all week and if you're, if you're a consumer uh, focused product, the weekend is probably when they're thinking about their personal stuff. Um, then you want to measure performance very soon after you send that email. If you don't want to send the next one without having reaped the benefits of what you found when you analyzed the first one. Um, because it, you can <coughs> go back and review and you might find some key things that you want to change the next time you get a send. You might find a big difference in 8 a.m. versus 9 a.m. People are sitting in the park in the line. If your uh, buyer persona is more likely female and she's more likely a mom sitting in a school line, then she might be on her phone, 
you know, sitting and waiting for the next car um, safely, we you hope. Know. And that might be when she's going to be the most likely to see that. You know. So because we've gone through so many, I'm going to stop and recap really quickly the four out of six steps that we've done. Um, we've done the bell went off. Create a killer landing page. Nurture leads with marketing automation. Tell your tribe. And next, we're going to promote the offer, the offer to lobby and social media. I'm going to stop here really quickly and we'll give Q&A at the end too and just see from that first part, because this, this next part has some detail as well, but I want to make sure we don't forget about the first part. So the offer of creating the landing page um, and nurturing your leads and telling your tribe. Any questions so far about any of those pieces? Yeah, so in the beginning, before you like, actually get people to land on that page and, and submit the thing, it just seems like if there's no brand awareness, they would be more of a button to actually give you that information. They don't have that, they, they really understand the value at that point if there's no familiarity with what you know, your company offers. And right, well, because they don't care about what your company offers at that point. If they're in the awareness phase, yeah, if, if let's say this, if they come to the website and they're sketchy on professional um, experience they might worry about you know you're going to spam me or whatnot but if that if you're doing you did that type of awareness offer they're just looking for a solution to their problem <coughs> they, they googled it and they found uh, they landed on a blog post and they started reading about it they're like okay i gotta get back to work i have to download this we have more about this it's probably easiest to, to describe that in a b2b a business to business marketing situation where they're looking for a solution to their business and your company offers a business solution. But there's also things like travel tourism where I might want just a fun guide for what to do when visiting um, you know this city. And if I am a company that cares about you know if I relate to travel tourism and I'm that guy, you know, they didn't they didn't think about putting more than down with it, but now they have the contact Again, it's medical contact information at the beginning, and now you've started that nurturing relationship with them through, through the automation. So, I mean, we, we have plenty of people with down and stuff all the time for ourselves and our clients. They had no clue who they were. It might not even be in a geographic region that um, that, that person serves, but there are one more voice out there that knows their brand, and uh, we've had situations where someone's flown in to the city to go to our client and you know a service that would normally be local because they felt like they weren't already in what they did. Is it because so many people are using the automation these days, are you seeing trends with customers where they're just they're not feeling the yeah, feeling that it's genuine or, you know, you just feel like, hi, Wendy, you know, everything you get is so personalized, you're like, these people can't possibly. That's why I say being creative and the personalization, um, people have gotten very wise to uh, to that person, you know, the name and the, the title. But if, if I'm very clear in the subject, that it's, if it's compelling, um, and it's taking that buyer persona into account as far as what they would react to, then typically you're tweaking your subject lines and you're, you're playing around with what works. I think the, the things that hurt all of this are the people that are sort of, the, it's more like a personal spam or a salesperson who just keeps on doing these, what really are tricky headlines where they're like, oh, I'm sorry I missed you and you think that you really, do, well that's, that is not being genuine and transparent. If you're genuine, transparent, but still creative with the compellingness of the, of the subject line, um, I don't like the tricky ones. I get them constantly. And so when I get a creative one, I actually will talk, I'll actually respond to the person and say, thank you for some creative email marketing. I've, I've actually met some great vendors that way. That they took, I, I felt better about their company because of the way they posted the email um, and when they were being more sneaky. That told me a little bit of something about what's approved practice in there. 
to the hospital. Okay, so on to blogging and social media. So, um, what we're going to do is repurpose and reuse. We don't want to now think of all this new content for the blog. Um, if, we, if we're focusing our blogging around the offer that we're trying to get conversion on, that is going to be best all around because the likelihood of downloading the offer is going to be higher if the blog post content and the offer match up very closely. Um, you can think about it as what stage of the buyer's journey are they in and making sure that the blog post is the same stage as the offer. Uh, in my experience, the data says it really matters more that the offer is very closely related to the content type. So if this says something about an engine, then the offer is something about an engine. That those two typically uh, correlate with a really good click through rate. Because you can have an offer that does really, really well on a six out of ten blog posts. Well, the, the, the blog posts that are not doing well, look at what the content of the blog post is. It could be the person just didn't make that that connection that they were going to get any further information or help or insight from the offer. Um, but you're going to repurpose and reuse because now you're going to take little snippets of that offer to create your blog post. Series of blog posts can be really great. If you've got certain chapters in your offer, you might expand on each of those more in a blog post. Um, but you certainly don't have to create any more work for yourself by coming up with these completely different blog posts that have a, a ton of work behind them. Any of us who've done blog posts know that you know, it's a time enough to just get the blog post out. You don't want to have to also uh, create an offer that, you know, if you get to re reuse that content, it, it is going to have value to you. Um, and then you're going to use smaller excerpts from the content or quotes or, you know, the things that you would bold and put the quotes inside the, the ebook. Those would be things you put on social media. And that's when you might get more creative and playing around with your different audiences. Um, if your offer will help both, for instance, marketing directors and um, CFOs, certainly nothing wrong with spending it once to the CFO audience and spending it separately to the marketing director audience and see how it does um, on different platforms. But I bet you really the CFO might not be on any of the social platforms. I'm just kidding. <coughs> um, and you're going to always include a call to action. A call to action on social to get them through the website. Because yes, social media has a great uh, value to your brand in general, your overall brand, but ultimately you can't measure anything if you can't get them back to your website. You can see a correlation. Sales increase when we increase your social posts, but it's not causal until I have the data. So we're, we really like data. Um, so you can always include the CTA in the social, and once they get to the website, call them to action. Get their attention, bring them to your landing page, um, and when on social, of course, actively encourage you to there, but also on blog posts. Now, I will say the percentage of people that will comment on a blog post, I don't, don't, don't uh, get upset if you're not getting a ton of comments. Um, there, it's not every day that people have that culture of, now I'm going to actually reply back to them. However, if you do ask a question at the end of the blog post, invite them to comment, um, you will get more engagement than if you just leave it up to them to decide. Um, also, in, under the tips for the blog post, you're going to create a compelling featured image because image plus text does a lot better than just text. Um, also, these days, there's a lot more data around the quality of the blog post versus the quantity of the blog post. If you're just writing six blog posts a week, just to be writing six blog posts a week, the data should be there to support it. If it's not, go back to maybe you only need one blog post a week, but it should be some really quality uh, content that someone would want to link to. Because inbound links are part of the whole search engine optimization algorithm. So you want to have 
people linking to your content. Um, so think about that. When you're creating this blog post, do I have not even just a feature image, but other media in the post that someone would find value uh, and useful enough to say, cite it on their blog post? Um, or you know, sharing it out on social media. Uh, that isn't the same kind of inbound link, but it certainly plays in with all the signals Google's looking at for whose content has authority. The speaking of SEO, we want an eye-catching and SEO-friendly title for our blog post, and of course the content that follows, <coughs> considering those same things, but eye-catching being not clickbait, but something compelling. Think about the pain points and challenges of your buyer persona. If having enough time is one of their challenges, and your blog post is about something that saves them time, capitalize on that. But don't forget about the fact that Google won't be able to find it if it doesn't have any of the keywords in it that they might be searching. Um, one thing I've seen here is people tend to think about the terms they use uh, versus the terms their, their purchaser would use. So you want to think about how would they actually call my product this, or would they actually search that, or, or is that language we use internally? Um, you know, SEO, CTAs, you know, all those things. Those may be things that someone would Google if they do this, or if they uh, are in a marketing director position and are doing uh, inbound marketing. But if there's someone who doesn't do this every day and is just looking for a solution, they may, may not use those terms at all. Um, so you want to also make sure that the blog post is easy to read. If you have just a long block of text, you know, if someone's trying to scan for that little nugget of information that pertains to what they were searching about, um, it's going to be hard for them. So you definitely want to make it consumable, bite-sized chunks with headers and bullets and um, numbering if, that, if that's appropriate. Just make it really easy for them to search it and find what they want um, and or decide, yeah, this covers everything I'm looking for and I'm going to go back up to the top. Do any of you guys have the same experience when you're surfing the web where you get to that daunting thousand word blog post and you might just give up and leave and that's still going to be what I want. Um, also, kind of standard these days, but making sure that people can share that blog post out easily. Uh, you want to do it at the top or the bottom or both. Make it easy to share on social. And test it every now and again, just in case. Um, sometimes it's kind of like a little thing that we like to say is if you have a team of any size, have them share the blog post first. Convince them it's a good idea. Um, because no one likes to be first. So if that blog post has zero shares, then someone may be less likely to share it, um, especially if it's older blog posts, than if they're ready to start. And they don't feel like they're shit, they, might, they don't stop and wonder if it's credible. So as far as social sharing, so we've got our blog post with our offer on it, or multiple blog posts with our offer on it, hopefully. Um, you're going to also want to share that out to social. And not just the first time you publish it, because nobody remembers. Even you don't remember when you published about that last. So don't worry about your audience saying, oh, I've seen that. Because if you have you know, Twitter, you never knew what was said since you looked at the last time. Um, you know, Facebook, a little bit more play to play, to play these days. But if, if you have employees sharing, um, this might be a harder sell, but if your, uh, your culture of your company is everybody's in sales, everybody's here to promote our company, everybody's here to support our company, um, and sometimes there'll be a few champions within your company that will help you with that. If they share it, in the, for instance on Facebook, it's much more likely for someone to see it than if just the brand shares it. Um, so in other words, the brand shares it, then they reshare it, you've got uh, some of that, but Facebook is very much pay to play these days. Um, but its frequency depends on the platform. Uh, you definitely don't want to be spammy, but it just depends on the platform as far as what makes what makes sense. You can share something 
every couple of hours on Twitter um, that people may not recognize it in their feed. I'm not suggesting you share the exact same thing every couple of hours, but um, if you do, change up the picture <laughs> so that it doesn't look like the same picture in your little photo box. Um, so you also want to make sure you select the best that works. Most companies have a lot of hands to do what you do. Um, and it just may not make sense for you to spend a lot of time on a channel you know, that you're a buyer persona that is not using. Um, again, looking at the data for that, you may get a, a whole lot of your Google Analytics and see tons of traffic from Facebook. But if none of that traffic is converting, you know, I'm not saying don't be on Facebook, but think about the invested time there. Um, if the traffic is not converting, if it's just, you know, uh, curious eyes. So choose the best networks for your audience and tailor your posts for each network. I know it is a time saver to use. Uh, the automation sends it out um, the same post, but it will sometimes look very funny and out of context on certain story. Um, you don't want to be out of context with your networks. Um, some of this is very one-on-one, so I apologize, but you know, leveraging the right hashtags. Um, we, had a, we had a client that had somebody on their team that was helping uh, promote their product, which was a product that was not uh, for minors. And every time their internal person posted, they did hashtag fun. So, I mean, that just didn't make sense. I mean, yes, a lot of people see hashtag fun, but most of them could not buy your product, and now you might be getting into some legal areas. So, um, measure everything and troubleshoot. So, we've uh, finished through all of those processes, and now we are measuring what worked and what didn't. Um, so we've got our landing page, we've got our email marketing going, we've got our workflows going, social media blogging, promoting uh, the offer, and now we're going to go back through. And I would say this needs to be at least 25% of the time on an email marketing campaign. I know it sounded like a lot of work before, but this is where the magic happens. Because all of us can make really, really smart guesses or um, guesses based on previous data, but until you see how your audience is reacting, you don't know really what we're going to do. Um, so we're, we want to revisit each element of the campaign to evaluate the success. And uh, so I'm going to recap here. We developed an offer. We created a killer landing page. We've nurtured the with marketing automation. Told our tribe. We promoted the offer. Now we're measuring everything, and we start with the landing page. So the landing page analytics can tell you insights to other things you have going on, like your CTAs and your email marketing and other things. But we're going to start there because if the landing page isn't converting, we don't want to continue to spend effort sending people to it. So you want to look at things like views, submission rate, of the form, the landing page, um, any new leads that you receive from that offer, or lead reconvergence, how that helped someone's trust build more with your company, um, and for sure customer conversions, because that's where you can actually say, this marketing effort created a customer, um, or this marketing effort upsold a customer, and that's the, the data that make sure that all of the time invested is, is working. So there is a benchmark, I mentioned it earlier, you want to aim for about a 20% submission rate on your landing pages. That's just a good average to shoot for. Um, if it's a more, if it's like an awareness type offer, you know, and so forth, I think that's a good measure. If it's more of a contact us or a free consultation, those will always perform at a lower rate because people go to your contact page just to look up your address uh, and other things. So if your metrics are running on those, um, you know, I wouldn't be as, a, as concerned with those types. But this would be more like an e-book or a podcast or, or that type of thing. 
So the different metrics that we're going to look at will tell us different stories. Let me kind of go through some troubleshooting really quickly. Um, so if your landing page has low views, you're going to want to go look at all the different ways you set traffic. Which one is the computing? <laughs> and that's the place that you might go back and reevaluate. If, if no one found it organically, if all the traffic to that blog post is through email marketing or social media, then there's probably something wrong with the keyword that you chose to either diffuse or focus on. Maybe it was just one that's going to be way too difficult to rank for, or the way they're searching it doesn't match up. Um, there is definitely nothing wrong with going back to a blog post, tweaking, and republishing. Um, when we just recommend when you do that to have an editor's note if it was any kind of substantial change uh, that happened. If you've got plenty of views, plenty of traffic is coming to that landing page, but nobody is converting, um, that's when you're going to look at those landing page design components that we talked about. You know, take a step back, maybe, maybe have a coworker that isn't involved in the project take a look from a different perspective. Is the title clear? Is the copy actually relaying value? Did it say why they need to have this now? Um, and why they would even provide their contact information to get it? Um, you know, looking at your form length, whether there's too many questions on the form, um, the button to submit, even making sure you test it yourself. Maybe there's something wrong and, uh, from that perspective, from a technical perspective, that needs to be addressed. Um, and if your customer conversions are low, there's lots of different things you want to evaluate. Is did this really target my buyer for some? Or did I get a bunch of leads from my peers in the industry versus um, our actual target customer? Uh, you also want to evaluate your workflows. You look at the workflows and see if people are unsubscribing and they're just not converting to the workflows going along too long. Um, or is your sales team so overwhelmed with, with you know, leads that aren't good that they're not getting to work with leads that are, that are good or they're not able to score them so that you're not able to score them so they can that. There's lots of different things to look at as far as if your customer conversions are low. Um, just depending on how you're, if you're able to capture that, that data or not. So as you're troubleshooting through, the metrics that you want to be concerned with on your calls to action, those are those visual buttons or graphics that bring people to your landing page. You've got your view to click rate, which has to do more with how well that call to action was executed. You know, if it was stood out on the page, it was on the right part of the page, again, like we talked about, if it was placed on the right type of content, then you've got your click to submit rate. If you're quick to submit, a lot of people are clicking, but they'll be submitting, and then again, look at that. Does your landing page match your call to action? Does it deliver? Is it very clear that that's the same thing? Or did they think they were getting something else? Um, your benchmark for your call to action um, is at least a 2% click through. Because if they're taking, if they're clicking, um, you know, that's, they may see on the page and have no interest in it, and that's fine. Um, but you, if, you, if you're not getting at least a 2% click through, there, there could be a bigger, a bigger issue, either in the CTA design or in the type of audience that you thought your website was getting, and maybe is not the same audience you were hoping for. So that, that click through rate also could say something about the offer, um, which is where you want to evaluate if that offer really did help your buyer or someone. So evaluate if your click to submission is low, how well it matches up with the landing page, reviewing your landing page components, going back to make sure the landing page has actually got all the nice components in place, um, and those are the things that we do there. So troubleshooting email, and these, this would apply both your workflows and your email marketing metrics, um, open rates and click rates, and unsubscribe and spam rates. So those are the things that I would be most concerned about. Um, again, if you get up to a certain amount of spams or unsubscribes, it could really hurt your email deliverability for future email sales. The benchmark you want here, this does vary by industry. So this is just a general benchmark. I would, be, I would go a little bit more specifically for 
your industry, but 25% uh, open rate is, in general, uh, considered a target, and a 4% click-through rate. Again, we're going to not give them too many things to click on in the email, so that we can get them to click on the thing we want them to click on. So on our blog post, the, met the um, metrics to watch here, a lot of these are available in Google Analytics. Um, the visits, views, and shares. Uh, your inbound links, again, that's where if someone links to your blog post, that's golden. Uh, unless they are a spammy network, in which case you want to get them on LinkedIn. There's a whole process for that. If you need to know, uh, feel free to contact me. Um, but the inbound links are, they're really good authoritative links. That's going to really help, help you. Um, bounce rates, exit rates, and average time on page. So you might have a really high bounce rate on a blog post, but if they have a really nice average time on page, that's a little bit less concerning than if there's, that they just come and leave. Um, so the exit rate is that that's where they left your website. So bounce rate is they didn't go anywhere else after that page. They left your website from that page. The exit rate is that that's the page they were on when they left your website. So, um, but again, you, the average time on page, it can be low average time on page, maybe you can even count with anything they left. And you have a really nice, good, speedy website. So it, you have to look at all those factors together to make a decision about whether that blog post is getting people available. And Google Analytics will do that. Mm -hmm. Google Analytics will take all that. For the pro version, do you need the pro version for that? Or I don't have the pro version. Okay. So, I, um, I, but you can see, you can see all the, this is more of webmaster tools, and that's free, mm -hmm. just set up webmaster tools for Google. Um, but I recommend, at the minimum, using both of those webmaster tools and Google Analytics. Um, and then your subscribers, that's not necessarily something you can see through Google, Google Analytics, although you may be able to do that in the tag manager. Um, but subscribers is typically something that's part of your CRM platform or your marketing software suite. Um, or your email marketing tool, depending on whether you have an all in one or uh, just one. But if subscribers are going up, that's a good sign. If subscribers are staying on the plateau, you know, that's something to look at. If they're, especially if they're going down, we don't want them to go down. Um, and your call to action with the rates. So those are the metrics that you want to watch um, for. And lead conversions, of course, lead, uh, converting those leads on your blog posts. And the comments, like I said, not everybody comments, but when you get a nice, credible one, it always gives you that one. <coughs> um, social media, these probably nothing anybody in here doesn't know, but definitely measure those website visits. How many fans and followers and engagement, all that should be in the effort of Yes, it's branding, but all that should be the effort of getting a conversion, so let's get them back to the website. If you're not sharing links to your website out, it's harder to get them in from social. Um, your post views and reach gives you something about the shareability of the content. Um, likes, comments, replies, and shares, always great. Um, and then definitely look at the trends from network to network, and anything you saw as performance improvements, depending on the time of day, um, or the day of the week. And your fans, followers, uh, connections, there's any big increases or decreases in that that can indicate you know, you're doing a bang up job, you're increasing your audience, or people are, typically they don't just leave unless they see something that just really doesn't sit well with them, but. You also have those auto followers that, I go right auto follow them right back. So um, that is pretty much it, what we covered. Covered the inbound marketing definition and all six steps, which I've now told you so many times you probably repeat them in your sleep. So we now have seven minutes. <laughs> What's some of the marketing software that you find helpful? You've mentioned HubSpot and Google Analytics and Webmaster Tools. What are some of the others? Um, there are other platforms that are, that are considered 
HubSpot like like Pardo, Eloqua, those tend to be, from what I understand, more expensive and less user friendly. I am, I will be waiting to say I'm partial to HubSpot. Um, but there are definitely things, and HubSpot has now started offering some free freeware that doesn't do as much as their more complex uh, software, but it's definitely for a smaller business. Um, that the, their free their CRM is free. Um, and they've got um, a marketing platform that's really low cost now versus the bigger one. But the fancy one is the one that would do all kinds of things. But you can use Google Tag Manager to measure a lot of action. It's really not as difficult as, the big thing that's harder to measure is, did that lead become a customer? And that's the big hole that for me, the HubSpot fills. Because then I can see, did that customer from this type of offer are they a higher spending customer than client than this type of offer? And that can guide what types of offers that you're creating and what content those are around. Um, but even if you can't measure that piece of it, if you can get enough data collected from your clients, and you can definitely see correlations. Um, in, in your case, from your clients, but for, for the mark for the person in-house, you know, if you can help um, your internal team or any external team help that's working with you, those data correlations of, you know, sales increased here, um, how many sales closed, that kind of data can help better guide your internal efforts um, and the, the efforts of anyone assisting you. And that the sales team's involvement is also very important because they are the magic. Once all the marketing magic done, the sales magic has to be able to take place or, you know, overall, uh, if you can't work together, you don't get that success for your company. But I know, I know also Constant Contact has some automation features. It just may not have as many personalization token capabilities. Um, it really, how, whatever software you use to create your form, uh, WordPress, for instance, has uh, Gravity Forms, a plugin that captures a lot of great information. As long as you can get the the data um, database capture of form fields to be able to be readable by something else, you can make it work. But I, I prefer solutions where you don't have to have a lot of techies involved. <laughs> um, I saw it was fun. Uh, um, Unbounce is another great place that they're, I mean, they are a paid solution. They specialize in landing pages. Um, and they, what's cool about their tool is it has a lot of uh, best practices built from data on conversion, what's called CRM or conversion optimization. I actually see those guys speak in, in person, and they're like really, really very knowledgeable, cool dudes. The guys who are on the bounce. Although they will curse if their PowerPoint presentation goes down. <laughs> you mentioned um, having your social media analytics on your Google Analytics, or? So yeah, yeah. You that. how do you get that? Well, Google has changed it, but you can still get it. Um, in Google Analytics, I'm trying to picture my screen, on the left-hand side, there is a social um, place, and if you can, if you're trying to get conversions into Google, you tell Google what you consider a conversion. Let's say that once somebody fills out this form, they get to thank you, and that, you know, that, if you see Google, if you see this URL, be presented to a visitor, then that's a conversion. So you can tell people in the regular plain time. Um, that conversion data can match up with your social media data. It'll tell you which network they came from, which URL it was that was shared to that network. Um, and so even though you can't get some of this, some of the same fancy stuff that you used to be able to, there's still some good aha. Uh -huh, Moments. And you'll see networks you didn't even think about as being social media on there. Um, Reddit, StumbleUpon, and you may consider that some people don't think of those by the way as social media. Do you think this translates well to like a service-based company and also maybe a company that provides services to the government? 
I think it depends on the person. Inbound marketing, internet itself, is very, very important to consider sales purchase. Um, because we think it's a considered purchase where someone is searching. Um, yes, yeah, the types of business I would say, I still think there would be some value in the components of inbound marketing, but all in all, it's a whole lot of effort that it wouldn't work as well. It would be like an emergency farm. That's that's not a considered purchase. That's my toilet is overflowing and I need the help now. But if that plumber is on social media and get their brand out there, pieces of the inbound marketing approach would certainly help uh, be the one they thought of when they have their toilet running over. But all the time, that's something it's more it works really, really well for a considered purchase. Anything I might be researching before I purchase it, which a lot of companies fall into that. But yeah, so government, for sure. It, it, if you've got certain things you can't ask for privacy reasons, you want to do those on the When you mentioned the quality versus quantity on the, the email and whatnot, I would always think that quality is better than quantity. Is there something you found that shows that? Yeah, that's what I was saying. I was thinking on, on blog posts specifically, and on email, for sure, because don't bombard people with a bunch of emails that don't have any value to them. But on blog posts, it, it seems that Google has gone from maybe giving as high of a value and weight to consistent uh, new content publishing on the site, because that was a signal, that's, that's one of the signals, that now there seems to be more weight going towards the signal would have to do with sharing of that content or inbound links. So that tells me spending more time on a quality piece than on just publishing anything that's going to come out of the Do you think that there's a sweet spot of you know, frequency and posts? Once a week, once a month? I do not personally don't think that um, right now we go, if you can, do once a month. Definitely that. If you can do once a week, even better. Some. It just depends on your competitors. You know, that might be way more than your competitors are doing. So I would evaluate competitors and the frequency of their blog posts. Um, but if you want if you want to resources, just spend more time coming up with something really, really strategic that has a lot of value versus turning out blog posts. And you might have to just see what what the traffic says. And your keyword rank. Right? You can pull that in Google. Google Trends, uh, Google Webmaster Tools as well. Google will tell you, you know, what your impressions were, um, what your rank was. It is a little biased to who, to geography. Like if they came to the site from locally, it doesn't necessarily say your universal rank is that, but if you only care about local, then it's great data. On the south side of things, um, do you know how many touches it takes once you have the lead to convert the lead? At least six. At least six. I would not be afraid of six. Yeah, that's about, I'm on the sales side. That's yeah. about my average. It's five to six before you even get a response. Yeah, it's, yeah. People are busy, and if they see your name over and over, it's just like random for company. Mm -hmm. They might be like, oh, okay, let me just see what this person wants. And hey, it turns out you have something really great to tell them about. But, um, yeah, I mean, six is the average number of touches they say mm -hmm. to to get some to get a click with or something. Or, or even to just or even talk to them on the phone. Yeah. But I would put in there as well. Like the data also says that the inbound lead might be easier to close because they feel like they chose you. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you guys for putting up with all of that nerdy talk. Definitely would like to connect with anyone here on any of the channels. And hopefully any other questions you have. I got a question to start up here too.